no, that doesn't conform to a normal genealogy chart. And I didn't know that because I've never done genealogy, but it worked for my purposes and my advisor liked it. So it made it into the dissertation and we just didn't try to redo it. But uh, Mary was married to Tom Barton. And then this traces Mary's family with the Pembles. Um, Harold Pemble married Edith Lyle. Um, so that's Mary's mom and dad. Mary was one of six children. And, and then a lot of Mary's research with the quilts uh, kind of branches off into her mom's side of the family. Her, her grandma, Harriet Klotz, did uh, quilt, um, but she didn't go much farther back with that side of the family with the quilt research. So it was grandma Mary Alice Krauss, who married Hugh Lyle. They had five children. And then um, the Krauses and the Lyles, Mary Evans married Joseph Lyle and um, she was a quilter. Mary Stevens, a grandmother, great grandmother was a quilter. And I tried to put on the chart a little bit about how they came to Iowa because what Mary found is that as, as people migrated westward in the United States, the quilts went with the women. Um, you needed quilts, you needed the warmth, you needed the quilts to be able to sleep at night, sometimes under the wagon on the ground with the quilts in the wagon if the weather was bad. Um, and the quilts were an integral part of the migration process. And you needed them when you got to your new home so you'd have ways to keep warm. So quilts were, were a necessity uh, for quite a while. And one of the things Mary studied as she looked at quilts was, you know, how did that change over time from quilts being a necessity to when blankets could be manufactured and sold cheaply, then, then quilts and quilting were more of a hobby or a luxury to have time to do that, yeah. or just consider, yeah. well, we don't need to do that anymore because we can go buy a blanket. So, you know, there's, there's an ebbing and a flowing in, um, in, in quilting as, as something that people do create uh, and love to do. Um, and then going farther back, you know, we see that family, there was a lot of information on the men in the family because you have newspapers that cover things like that, like, you know, who three sons out of um, Joseph and Mary Evans Lyle's family um, served in the Civil War. Um, Winston Krauss moved his family to Iowa in 1854. And then when the Civil War started, he and eight of his brothers fought in the Civil War. Um, we have people who served as, um, uh, let's see, Charles Delisle, who's on the Lyle side. It was Delisle when they came from France, but at some point you didn't want to have an association with the French, so you dropped the D and you just used the Lyle name then. Um, but he, through the congressional record, uh, you could find the, the continental records of the Continental Congress. Um, you could find the record of Charles Delisle and their son and James Delisle. Uh, Charles Delisle served under George Washington and was a munitions uh, major of artillery. And so all of that is in the, the record, the printed records of the Continental Congress. Um, I even found the secret place at Drake where they keep all the printed records of the Congress and the Continental Congress because when you started a university, the government gave you such things, you know, these printed and bound copies. And I think I was in the part of a part of a library I wasn't technically supposed to be, but I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And well, I didn't know it until the library security guard uh, mentioned that maybe I needed to leave and checked my ID and all of that. And like, yeah, it, it was a fun evening, but I did find the book. So it was, it was kind of cool. Uh, but she found lots of stuff about the men. Um, because they were doctors or they were pastors or, you know, they were significant people and their stories were recorded. But the women, their work, Mary discovered, was often recorded in the things they made. Um, so, so quilts were one way that she could learn about the lives of women. All right. Um, this is a quilt, uh, a fence rail quilt. Whoops. I think I skipped over a couple because I, yeah, see, I pushed the button too fast um, because it wouldn't go. Um, this is a, this is a, an album quilt that um, Mary's mom made and Mary was in sixth grade. And by the time she was in sixth grade, she was making most of her own clothing and entering clothes in the state fair and winning top prizes because she was an excellent 
an excellent sewist. Um, I'm trying to use non-sexist language, you know, and seamstress is good, but there are a lot of men now who sew and sewer is okay, except when you write it out, it's spelled like sewer. And if you're reading something, you might not catch, you know, that we're talking about a sew person, not a sewer. So I like, I like sewist um, as a word, but Mary was, Mary learned from a very young age how to sew and how to make clothing. And um, she, uh, she remembers, you know, being in sixth grade and some fabric from one of her dresses is in this quilt along with her signature. And um, the, the signatures are all from family members, um, daughters, granddaughters of, of Mary Alice Krauss Lyle, her women friends, um, some, some more distant relatives, some neighbors. Um, each fabric relates to a dress that that, that woman wore. So it's, it's just kind of a, in a snapshot of 1930s. These are the clothing, you know, this is the fabric people made clothing out of. So these were cutting scraps from, from the dresses they made. And it's, I can remember my grandmother with a family quilt saying, I can just picture all of the women in those dresses as she, as she caressed the fabric on the quilt and could remember the, the fabric being made into a garment and one of her women relatives wearing it. So Millie, do you know which one is Mary's block? I do. If we go to this one, I typed up the name because it was too hard to read. Let's see. Um, uh, this is Edith Louise Pemble. That's Mary's sister. Where do I see Mary's name? I've, I've found it on here before. Mary Alice Pemble is two in and three up. So this would be Mary's. And she remembers making the dress um, mostly she remembered the yards and yards of bias tape she had to sew around ruffles and things. And I'm not sure she remembered that fondly the way it was written in her notebook. But I just loved this, um, this detail because too often with a family quilt, you know, you have the signatures and you don't think about writing them down, but Mary did that for her family. So she, this was all in her handwriting. So I put it on a typed graph because her handwriting is a little hard to read. Um, and, but under each name, you know, she, she put the relationship. And to me as, uh, you know, a writer, sometimes I think, here are all the characters I need for a novel. You know, <laughs> we've got the sister of Martha Dunbar Gilmore. We've got Mrs. Chaz Clocken, Clockinger, who's on the same telephone line as the Lyles. Well, that's pretty funny because, uh, you know, she was party line. Line. <laughs> you know, maybe maybe some of you remember party lines. Apparently, my folks were on a party line when I was born, and I just loved when I was two to pick up the phone and talk into it. And mom can remember you know, hearing the operator yelling, get that baby off the phone, um, because party lines kind of annoy people when a baby is babbling on it. But, um, you know, sister-in-law of a Sunday school teacher, Mrs. W. Graf, Graf, um, and uh, you know, grandmothers, it's, it's all it's all recorded and the relationships so that people will know who these are. Um, there was also a handwritten note under Mary's uh, graph of the of the names that said Grandpa Hugh M. Lyle and Mr. Charles Clockinger um, were bank directors at the time when the banks failed during the Great Depression. Um, and Mary's only note to that was Grandpa didn't lose, but Kay did, meaning Clock Mr. Clockinger. Um, so I tried to look up bank failures and and I did a lot of research. I'm really good at rabbit holes. Well, I don't know if I'm good at that. I don't know if you wanna be good at a rabbit hole, but you know, doing research for my dissertation, the fact that the bank failed and Hugh Lyle and Charles Clockinger were, it was not germane to my research, but I couldn't help myself. I had to try to find the bank they were in and I wasn't exactly sure which city. I knew um, that, uh, I knew about where the Lyle farm was and I tried to pick a town close to that, but it was gonna take more time than I, so I, I tore myself away from it after I'd already invested too much time. But just to think about, you know, the banks failing and what that did to, to the people who were in charge of them. 
um, you learn a lot about the times. All right. Um, let's see. That's not the quilt I wanted next, but okay. Now the buttons are going to catch up, so it's going to flip somewhere. Um, this is a bluebird quilt. And why is that one here? I must have changed things around when I wasn't looking. Um, it's a family quilt of an unknown maker, came down through the Pemble family, and it's 78 by 80 inches. So this is a big quilt. So those birds are big. And I'm not sure, you know, I haven't seen this bird applique pattern. Somebody may have made it up. Um, and it's just an interesting quilt, but this is one of those quilts that you just wonder, you know, because nobody in the family had recorded anything. They probably thought that everyone would always remember whose quilt this was. And now there's, there's no information other than it, it has been passed down in the family and um, we don't know much more about it. Oh, that one was before there. Okay. This is the one I thought was next. That's what I'm looking for. Um, Mary was all, always very good at labeling things. When I was at her son's house with uh, two of her sons and her granddaughter, Leah, and a great granddaughter, and um, I wanted to talk to them and get the, uh, the stories that that I could to give some life to all of the archival research I was doing in the collections um, and the files and the quilts and the objects at the State Historical Museum. And they had set a table, it was like a feast of objects, because to tell the story of Mary's family and her, her um, extended family, her parents, grandparents, and then their, her, her descendants, it was all done through objects. Here's what we did, what we made, what we loved. And it was just a fascinating way to, to look at a family's life. And um, this quilt was made by Mary Alice Krauss Lyle. So this would have been Mary's grandmother. And Mary Pemble Barton is Mary Alice, was Mary Alice Pemble. So she was named after this grandmother. Um, and it was, the quilt was made for one of Mary's cousins because the grandmothers made a quilt for each of the grandchildren. And then eventually the quilt was given back to Mary um, and Mary put a handwritten note on the, da on the back. This is for Leah someday. And as the family showed me the objects that they were using to tell the story, if you looked on the bottom or the back or something, there was usually a, a note or a sticker from Mary saying, this is someday arts, or this is someday John's, you know, she knew who she wanted to have, have the things in the family. Um, this one um, has a very large stain in the middle. You can probably see it in the top third of the quilt, right in the center. Um, I'm not sure what it is. To me, it looked like blood, but it's there. And it kind of puzzled me because one of the things, I mean, it doesn't puzzle me that a quilt gets a stain on it because that happens if you use them, but it puzzled me because a lot of Mary's research um, Okay, she was good at rabbit holes too. I kind of think in a previous life, Mary and I would have been very, very good friends if we had lived at, or if we had known each other. I mean, we lived at the same time for a while, but um, she liked the rabbit hole. So when she started studying quilts, it occurred to her to wonder, well, I wonder how women took care of the fabric they used. So she started doing research into the products or the natural uh, components that people could find, whatever it was, what did they use for soap or for detergent or to get stains out? And then it occurred to her to wonder what caused the stains because sometimes you could tell something was blood, sometimes you weren't sure exactly what the stain was. So she started reading women's magazines uh, of the day, of the period of the quilts she was researching because back then, just as now, women's magazines are full of, of advice. So like one magazine recommended that if women have sunburn or blemishes on their face, they should rub strawberry juice on their blemishes or their sunburn before they go to bed tonight and that would help heal it. Well, uh, you notice on some quilts from that time period, there are these kind of reddish brown stains right at the top edges of the quilt. It's probably, or it could be from, from this 
uh, tonic for, for curing your blemishes. So Mary would get interested. She'd find a stain and wonder, well, what could have caused that? How might they have washed it out? Um, so in some ways, I was a little surprised to see the stain because Mary had this quilt for quite a while. And she had done so much research on historical care of fabric. And that was one of the topics after she had become a noted authorian, uh, authority in quilts and textiles <laughs> and all of those things. Um, she, she was invited to lecture all over the country at different kinds of events. And one of her speeches was, um, you know, a historical care of textiles. And she, you know, was thinking about all of the grease from the cooking and, and um, butchering, you know, the stains that would come from butchering and all of the things that would have discolored water back in the time. So, you know, were, were spots actually caused sometimes by the water you were using to wash things. She became an expert in all of those things. Um, so that was one of her, one of her speeches. Okay, I pushed the button and nothing happened. We'll try again. There we go. Okay. Um, this next one is another Pemble family quilt, and um, it's a traditional basket, blue and white, and Mary inherited it from the Pemble side with an unknown maker. Um, she did know that, you know, again, her grandmother lived 1863 to 1940 um, and had what may have been uh, kind of an unusual job for that time for a woman. She was the postmistress of a town and maybe there were more than I know of. Every time you learn something, you have to test it against other evidence. And since that's something I did not need to know for my dissertation, I didn't check. But you know, I thought, well, that must have been a rather unique job for a woman at the time. But maybe it wasn't. Maybe the women did those jobs because men were farming or, um, doing other kinds of work. I don't know. That's more research for another time. And that's kind of the same thing that drove Mary. She was a highly curious person. So when she would find something, she would always test it. She would figure out what is known about this person. What can we compare it to? Let's compare it to other places. So she probably, if she wanted to know if there were other women postmasters, she would have looked up the records to see in small Iowa towns, who were the postmasters. Um, there are ways to find those things and learning from Mary, you never just take something at face value or put today's spin on yesterday's times because we don't know. Um, so that's another thing that could be researched. Uh, let's see, the next one, this is a nine patch made by Harriet Kloss Pemble, her grandmother. And in some ways, this one was a little surprising to see because Harriet's quilts were almost always applique, like the flower quilts. She did a lot of, in Mary's uh, journals and notebooks, there are a lot of photos of um, Grandma Pemble's flower, applique flower quilts. And Mary said that that's probably because, uh, you know, Grandma Pemble lived in town and, um, uh, her other grandmother, Grandma Grandma Lyle, was out on the farm and working, you know, the orchard and, or they lived in town, but there was also, you know, the orchard and all of these other things. So, uh, or that was, yeah, that was Mary's mom. Um, her other grandmother was a pioneer farm wife, settled, you know, with her family in Iowa and was too busy to applicate. You see why I needed the chart at the beginning? Otherwise I get I keep getting confused on which, which relative is where. Um, but Mary's grandmother, Lyle, made mostly piece quilts like the fence rail quilt that had the blood stain. Uh, and Mary's grandma, Pemble, mostly did applique because she had the time to do that. Um, this picture um, I found in Mary's genealogical research. And I, uh, at some point in the, looking through the things in the collection at the historical museum there was a cassette tape that said it was an interview with mary um, that was done in about 1986 i believe an oral history interview and um i took that they they let me take that tape to a professional to have it converted into a cd 
because if it's a one of a kind tape, which it was, we didn't want to put it in a cassette player and listen to it and run the risk of breaking the tape. So we took it to a professional and in the comments, um, she must have had, and this is the problem with just an audio today, you know, we probably would have taken our cell phone and filmed and recorded the conversation, but you could tell she was pointing to things and, sh and showing things as, as she uh, told her stories, just like her sons did when they shared with me. I didn't film it, but I took, I took uh, lots of photographs so that I can match what they were showing me with their words. But she was pointing to a picture of the sister-in-law of a grandmother and said, and Mary said, she looks a little like, to me, she looks a little bit like a dried apple doll. And um, I thought, oh, poor, poor sister-in-law of grandmother. Um, but I noticed her, her hand and the way, the way her fingers on both hands just seemed to be so oversized. And I wondered if this was a condition, you know, she might have been born with or what would cause her hands to be like that. Well, um, one of Mary's sons, the one who lives in Uganda and is a doctor, when, when they were kids and Mary had four little boys um, kind of in a row. So she had these, you know, cute pictures of stair-step little boys and, and her son, Tom, was the oldest. Uh, when they moved into their house in Ames, um, on Brook Ridge Avenue, it backed up against a creek and the boys were always out digging and playing in the creek. And Tom at one point found, started to find pieces of a horse skeleton. He was finding the bones of a horse skeleton and their family outings were often walking up and down the creek and they had uh, lots of, of, you know, Indian projectile points and, and different um, buffalo skulls and different animal kinds of bones. They even found a monkey skull when they were digging up where a petting zoo used to be on another property close to theirs. And, and Mary encouraged this. She wanted her kids to be exploring and asking questions and wondering. And Tom, um, he ended up unearthing almost an entire horse skeleton and then he assembled it and was going to use it then for a, a bone study as a science fair project. And Mary thought he also ought to have another uh, skeleton. So they contacted one of Mary's brothers who still lived in the country and got a, uh, there was a deer carcass that had gotten hung up on a fence. So they brought that home and the boys uh, boiled it clean to get the bones and, and they still talk about the smell and everything. But what made it unique was the bones had extra growth on the horse skeleton. And Tom could identify when he did the research on that as, as a young boy that um, it, talking to people at the vet school and stuff, because that's what you do when you have questions, you find people with the answers. And it's so fun when young people take that initiative. But um, he discovered that the horse probably had had a number of injuries and it caused all this extra bone growth. So I sent him this picture and I said, you know, um, since you are the bone expert, and then he did go on to become a doctor, um, I asked him what might have caused this. And he said, um, my best guess is that the bones and muscles of both of her hands were enlarged from a life of, of very heavy physical labor. They appear even larger with the loss of core body mass due to old age and possibly poor diet and or chronic illness. Her fingers are not deformed as happens with rheumatoid arthritis, nor is it just the joints that are swollen as happens with osteoarthritis. I have seen more extreme examples of this, even involving just two fingers on each hand and the thumb in an older man here in Uganda, whose lifetime occupation was braiding rope out of sisal fibers. So looking at this photo, you know, we might see someone who looks like a dried apple doll with misshapen hands, um, but a little research tells us this woman lived a really hard life and worked really hard. And um, that's, that's what we can see if, if we do some research. All right, the collection. Um, I uh, started, I'm starting here with the time when Mary started to collect quilts. And the reason she started to collect quilts was because she and her, her husband was also named Tom. Um, they liked to go to auctions together because they were always looking for things and learning from things and researching things. I mean, the objects weren't just for decorative purposes. Everything she purchased, they used, but it was also at, 
to further their own interests. It could be pottery, it could be um, antique furniture. Tom liked to refinish and restore uh, pieces and then do the research on where they were made and, and what kinds of wood and all of that. And, and it was just their hobby. Basically their hobby was to research and learn and then show it through the things they did with their hands, um, which fascinates me. But she and Tom were at an auction in 1967 and an auctioneer, you know, held up an old quilt and he said it, he called it a rag. And that kind of caught Mary's attention. And Mary said um, in an interview with Georgia Bonesteel once, she said the auctioneer wanted $3 for it. And I, I bought it because all she could think of was how much work had gone into that. She wasn't a quilter herself at that point, but all she could think of was the work that went into it. And for $3, that was a lot of work. Um, so she bought the quilt and then she bought a couple of boxes of fabric scraps. And uh, when she went to pay for them, she said, somebody said, I bought a lot of work and I did. Um, and that began her interest in fabrics. Part of Mary's collection are thousands of swatches of fabric that she has identified, sometimes matching with catalogs, sometimes matching with garments and then the garments to different fashion catalogs or fashion magazines. So she was working on creating a, a, a collection of fabrics that could be dated so that you could work to date quilts to figure out you know, when they were made and more about them from that. Um, so that's what started her collecting. Um, she told a reporter in uh, the 1980s, um, the, the quilt that she had originally purchased at this auction was a wild goose chase quilt and I have no idea where it is. It's, it's not in the collections at the historical museum. I couldn't find just a wild goose chase quilt in the collections at Living History Farm from the documentation she left. Um, but this quilt is here because it does have the flying geese around the edges. But she told the reporter in the 80s, I think there will always be a wild goose chase for me to find out something more. There's so much more that needs to be learned and written down for future generations. Um, so Mary's goal was to collect quilts before they were either treated as rags and destroyed, or she also started to notice as the years went on, uh, antique collectors and dealers were coming in from out of state because Iowa farm sales were a great place to buy quilts and they were taking the quilts out of the state. And Mary's prime goal was to make sure that Iowans would always have quilts to study um, that were important or significant to Iowa in some way. Maybe they were brought to Iowa by a family who migrated here. They might've been made here. Um, maybe they were made by or given to somebody who was an Iowan. Um, maybe it was just a classic example of a pattern that people in Iowa made at the time, but she wanted us to have, have things to study. Um, and that was her whole goal of, of creating this collection. Um, this quilt is, wait, I think I went one too far. Yes, this is the next thing I wanted to show you. Um, Mary did start buying these quilts at auction, but then she said, I truly knew I was a collector when I went to visit my mother and she had this piece of an old quilt. It was all that was left, you know, just this block that she'd bound off um, and her mother was using it as a kneeling pad in the garden. And I've, I've touched this and it's, it's, barely a 16th of an inch thick. So I can't imagine it was giving her knees much cushion, um, but she was kneeling on it. And Mary said, don't do that. I want that. And she took that and she said, that's the moment she knew she was truly a collector of quilts. Um, and please feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions along the way, uh, because I get started talking. And then, especially when I'm talking to my computer, I kind of forget that there are people out there. Um, so don't, don't be afraid to interrupt me. Um, if you have any questions as Millie's going, feel free to write them in the chat box and we'll and get through them. Besides, it gives me time to take a drink. Right. Um, this um, was a log cabin quilt that Mary collected because that was a very popular pattern. But she said this one had been made with such precision and good color sense um, that the maker must have been a master, a master quilter. Um, tiny quilting stitches. And this one I think has turned out to be kind of the Where's Waldo quilt of this exhibit because Mary noted that there are two distinct prints that she did not see 
very often or find elsewhere. And she, like I said, she has thousands and thousands of, of identified fabric swatches. Um, one is a Star of David print and one is a lighthouse print. And the day, um, the last time I was at the museum for the reception and everything, somebody had found, I think it was the lighthouse print, but they hadn't yet found the Star of David. So people are, are looking for those two prints. Um, so this one is hand quilted 12 stitches, 12 stitches um, per inch. And it was made by an ancestor of Georgetown who was a former Dean of Engineering at Iowa State University. Um, the shadow area it, of this, it's a lightweight quilt and the shadow areas are made of rich brown fabrics found in quilts made in the Eastern United States. Um, Mary made note of, of where fabrics were most often found and then when they started coming, um, you know, moving west. And then the light areas are predominantly white prints. Mary noted, um, you know, the precision in it and then these, these unique patches. And she wanted to collect, you know, the excellent examples, um, everyday examples. She collected a little bit of everything. This one is, is um, unique and it just has such a, a thorough provenance. We know, you know, who made it, when and where. Um, and it is a beautiful, beautiful example. Um, the bear's foot quilt. Um, two color quilts, you just can't, I, I don't, you can't beat a quilt. <laughs> I just love, love the, the two color quilts, especially the blue and white. And this is made out of indigos. Um, Mary purchased the quilt in 1976. So, and it was made in 1860. So more than a hundred years. I'm going to ask real quick. Um, yeah. Luis has a question on our past one on the okay. past quilt. Can you point out the two distinct shapes? Two distinct shapes on which one? This one, the log cabin, I believe. The log cabin. Mm -hmm. um, the shapes, um, it's not, whoops, What's didn't that? mean to do that. Um, it's, it's the barn raising pattern, so it's not the shapes, but there are two distinct prints. Somewhere in there, there is a print that has the Star of David, and somewhere in there, there's a print that has a lighthouse. And those, those are the pieces. And from here, I can't tell, even if I blew this picture up, I would not be able to see it well enough. So that's why it's kind of the Where's Waldo quilt. If you remember that book series for wow. kids, you know, you had you to know, find we, we could probably do a little search and maybe try to get a photo of that. That would be fun if you and could. share that with people. Yeah. 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 Because those were, those were the prints that Mary said made this unique. And that just shows you how closely she studied quilts. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I had people coming up to me at the reception saying, where are they? And I had to admit, I have no idea because the first time I saw these quilts in person, most of them, a couple of them I'd seen out before, but they're, they're, they're stored, you know, and they're in a museum, they're, they're rolled on, on coils, uh, with batting to preserve them. And they're not just out to look at. So I, I actually curated the exhibit from, um, you know, little tiny, probably inch by inch, inch and a half by inch and a half photos from the museum catalog um, to try to pick the quilts and going on the, the notes in Mary's notebook. So the first time I actually saw these quilts, that's why I was just giddy that day because they're so beautiful. And, and um, to see them in real life and how big they were uh, was just fascinating um, for me. Um, this next quilt, all right, a democratic rose. And it looks like, when you look at this, it looks like those flowers that are coming off the twisty green vines are kind of a pink. Actually, that was red fabric, but it has deteriorated and rotted out. And so the only, what makes it look pink is the only fabric left is the fabric held down by the quilting stitches. And this one, um, this was made in 1860, 72 by 75 inches. And it is in um, such delicate condition that it is in a, a case at the museum. We weren't allowed to hang this one on the wall. Um, but it was machine quilted at 20 to 25 stitches per inch. In 1860, this was machine quilted. So, you know, I can remember back when at the, um, the AQS shows, there was a huge uproar of, you know, does machine quilting count? Do they have to be by hand? Is, is hand work only quilting? 
well, back in 1860, women who had a sewing machine, why would they spend all that time working by hand unless they loved to, you know, if, if they could do it on a machine, you know, because women were grasping or not grasping, but embracing, you know, the new technology. And so this is an example of a machine quilted quilt. And had this one been hand quilted, we probably would have lost all of the red fabric in those. It's just because at 20 to 25 stitches per inch, it's holding in threads <laughs> of fabric um, still in the, in the space. Um, the next one is a big question mark. Um, we don't know what this quilt is other than um, it was made, now I can't find my sheet on that one. Oh, here it is. Um, it's a log cabin and a barn raising set. No other uh, information is available. I don't know, this is in Mary's collection. Maybe it was a quilt top somebody gave her and she just hadn't done the research yet. You know, with the big red squares, I would think she would be able to date the fabric. And the other thing that, you know, makes it difficult to date a quilt I don't know about you all if you're quilters, but I know that sometimes I collect fabric and it might be 10 years before I use it. Or I finished a quilt in January of 2020 that I had started in January of 1990. So it took me 30 years to finish it. So there's quite a span of fabric in that quilt and, and things. So it's pretty hard to date, but sometimes between the, the, the fabrics, and what is used on the backing and then what's used as the batting, you can kind of tell how much time may have passed from when one started. But this one we know nothing about other than it's probably um, turn of the century, 1900s, early 1900s. But I thought it was interesting because it's asymmetrical. And you know, if we think about modern quilting, um, asymmetrical is one of the things that goes into modern quilting. But today's modern quilting will be, you know, the future's traditional quilt, you know what I mean? Because quilting evolves. And so some of the things, if you really look at the old quilts, there are a lot of quilts that look like they'd be made by a modern quilt maker today. Um, but that was just because they were on the edge of trying new things back then. Um, so this one, this one raises more questions than it answers. Um, but it's something to continue studying. Um, and it's a good reason then you should always document your quilts, right? Um, this is one of my very, very, very favorites on, in the exhibit. I just love how this one, it looks like, you know, saucers floating in space, you know, or flying saucers or something. It's, it's string pieced um with equilateral triangles you know and, and put together kind of like the kaleidoscope and then each one the last row is <clears throat> the dark print so that when you put them together you have this nice it's, a, it's like a dark sashing but each one has the same outer ring of fabric and i just think that is just lovely um it was made in 1917 uh, and six stitches per inch hand quilted uh, probably because of the thickness of the fabric and the batting and the, um, the uh, seams. Um, so that one, it just, that one uh, graphically is just, I love it. And that's another one that, you know, you might look at and say, oh, that could be a, a, a modern quilt today, maybe. Um, this one, Mary called humorous or capricious, and this is a quilt top. And this one, she dated to 1871 to 1900 um, because of the fabrics and she called it humorous or capricious because she couldn't find any known uh <laughs> any known pattern for this quilt and i have to laugh because i i have something similar to that in my closet from when i finished making uh, my daughter's wedding quilt i just sewed all the little scraps and cutting pieces and little you know everything left into a quilt and it looks kind of like that. I mean, it's different colors and everything, but it's just, well, I've got all this stuff and I need to sew something. You know, there are days that that's my therapy. I just need to sew something. So I like to think about, you know, what was the woman thinking when she did this? And, and was she just emptying out all of her scraps and wanting to put something together? And, and it's a quilt top that hasn't been finished, but it, it, it does it does share, you know, some story, some, I guess the, in poetry, the words that aren't there are often the silences are kind of 
uh, what make it special. And for me, that's kind of what this one is. It's just, I wonder about this person. Um, this is a Pennsylvania Lemoyne star. Mary purchased it in 1978. It was made, you know, again, she purchased it more than a hundred years after it was made. Um, and this is in the time frame when she really wanted to be keeping quilts in Iowa because about the bicentennial time is when, you know, between the bicentennial and the first time there were exhibits of quilts in, uh, you know, in, a, in an art museum, it kind of brought the art back to life. And uh, this was one that she bought and the brown fabric, it's kind of, it's got a sheen to it. It's got a glazed or polished, polished finish. And she said the fabric there, uh, the brown fabrics were a lot like what was used uh, in on furniture at the time. So, you know, maybe somebody had some leftover fabric from covering a piece of furniture, who knows. Um, this but that quilt is in great shape. It is, mm -hmm. I'm shocked at how old that quilt is. Mm -hmm. To me, it looks like it's new. <laughs> yeah, and, and this one is in a case too. They didn't want us to hang it just because of the weight of it and didn't want to risk because of the age. Um, but yeah, it is, it's in beautiful condition. Um, so that was a fun one. This is a modified oak leaf and reel. Mary purchased it in 1978 and it was made by Sephania Eveline Painter. I love that name, um, great name. Um, the, the fabric on the white background, it, it gives a nice, I mean, it's a bright contrast. Um, and then the complementary colors, so it stands out. Um, it was appliqued in Leon, Iowa. Um, Mary said that the green fabrics with faded spots of blue uh, may have been made earlier than 1902 when Seth and I have finished the quilt. So the fabric may be older. And that's, she also studied, Mary studied dye processes because dyes, you know, depending on if you were making green by over dyeing yellow with blue or vice versa um, and, and the different ways they made the colors would fade differently. And so she studied that and then she found uh, they were called receipt books, but the different things that had the recipes or receipts for the for the dyes and how they were made and how they were applied. Uh, so that was that was another area of research. You know, you have to know how a fabric was made, how it was dyed, how to wash it, anything connected. She did a lot of research, deep dive into the research and then develop lectures and um, just a wealth wealth of knowledge and she wanted to put it all in a book and I think it just it got so big um and I don't I, she could have written a lot of books with all the things she had um so the and for this one instead of a binding the plain white backing was just wrapped around to the front and stitched in place and this one is in beautiful condition too um 1902 um Millie so, do you yes. know where, do you know where Stephania lived um, Leon, Iowa, I believe, um, or probably near there. I don't know if, let's see. Yes, yeah, Steph and I have finished the quilt and it was created in Leon, Iowa. So she made it in Leon, Iowa. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Pineapple quilt. I This one has a lot of black, um, oh, yeah. is it velvet? I'm trying to think. So um, Let's see. The edges are bound with a woven braid, which is kind of neat. Um, now I can't find my note on the, but it, it has a sheen. All of that fabric is is like the same fabric, but but the way I is it velvet, Carissa? Can you do you remember? I, I thought it was just silk. I didn't. Okay, no, maybe it is a okay. silk. It's got a sheen to it because depending on how you look at it, it gives all those neat shades and the shading. I heard a lot of people standing in front of that quilt saying that this was their favorite one in the exhibit. And it is, it's just gorgeous. Um, but this is a quilt where Mary was also interested in the names of quilts. And this one was called a pineapple quilt, but the same pattern um, can be called Colonial Pineapple, Maltese Cross, Washington Pavement, Chestnut Burr, Church Steps, Windmill Blade, Log Cabin, uh, and on and on. And sometimes the names changed with time. So she would look through magazines and then catalogs of quilt patterns and things and date them. So she has 
files and files of this information to be able to date quilts um, partly by the, uh, the name the quilt was called by who made it. So that helped you know what time frame they made it in. Um, this, you know, the dating, in one of her speeches, she said, you know, I'm not in the dating game to catch a man because my time for that is long past. I'm in it to figure out, you know, when quilts are made. And she had a very subtle sense of humor that everybody loved. This quilt was really fun to hang because it's not square. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you just got to make it look as square as you can on the wall. But this, um, Mary called it a glitter, or Mary called it a framed quilt. I think, I can't remember if it's in um, Brackman, the Brack, Barbara Brackman's book, if it's the Litter Star, but it's known by both, but Mary called it a frame quilt. And she said that the star set as a medallion um, like this with all of the borders was um, something more um, common in old Eastern quilts than in Iowa quilts. But then again, as quilters moved westward or made quilts for children or families who were moving westward, then it it you know you saw it more and more in in the Midwest area as well. So part of how you can date an old quilt is by styles, you know, before the styles migrated with the people to this part. And I noticed in a story in Quilt Folk magazine, um, I can't remember when because I never read the issues right when they come out, but I I pick them up and read them later and then I never know which one's the current one but there was a story somebody had asked you know can you do you notice as you go all over the country and do these regional magazines do you notice that there are different styles in different places and the answer now is no because you know the the quilt world uh is so um you know with the fabric being marketed nationwide or worldwide and the patterns as well and the uh you know the the classes and things you can take online or in person and the quilt makers the quilt designers travel and do lectures and things um there's nothing that's really regional anymore you know you you can find any kind of quilt anywhere um this is a really good example of a basket quilt made in 1865 um 1870 range and um this one was uh had a note from the maker when mary bought it and it said this quilt will go to question mark because even then the maker was wondering who would inherit her quilt blocks were sewed by my sister maddie in 1865 and were given for a wedding present of use some of my mother's aunt mary slater's and myself dresses all in calico that was 50 cents per yard civil war prices um so just sometimes the stories that do come with them, um, then it would be interesting, you know, to find out this quilt was probably made in a northern area because the south was was blockaded and couldn't get calicos and things. So um, it's just interesting to to notice those details on on the quilts. Um, as Mary became known as the, uh, the a quilt expert and a textile expert. Um, people sought her out and they either wanted her to examine their quilts, wanted her to speak at their meetings, wanted her uh, to do uh, programs for them. And she said, I never sought publicity, but it started finding me and people began contacting me about quilts they thought I might want to see. Um, so as she became known, that's part of how she she got such a body of, of knowledge. And if you think about this, Mary started her research, okay, in 1967, or when she bought the first quilt was when the research started. Um, that was a long time before the internet. So when you start collecting or searching for things, it's not like you know what's out there. You don't have a pre-made list of these are the things that are available. So these are the things I'm looking for. It's kind of like, oh, I find this. Well, then that raises more questions. So you go find things to answer those questions. So it's kind of a, a hit and miss research style that isn't quite how we do it anymore because um, we have all kinds of, of help and, and you know with the quilt index, index and everything and some of those things going online now, um, it's so much easier to do quilt research, but it's all because people like Mary Pemble Barton did it the hard way to start with. Um, all right, this is a horrible picture of me, so don't look at me. I wanted the, the study panels 
but this is while we were hanging quilts, you know, and you're looking across the room at something trying to decide, is that straight or not? Um, but study panels, Mary assembled about a hundred, what she called study panels. And that's what, don't look at me, look past me. And then you'll see these, they're, they're blocks that she stitched to muslin, um, either to showcase colors of a certain period. Uh, and then behind me, there's a little child's dress sewn. And then some of the blocks have that fabric in it. So showing how, you know, clothing was made and cutting scraps used for quilt. Um, sometimes they're arranged by a similarity in pattern. Um, the one to the right there, the, um, those, those uh, striped looking um, banner things, those were like Chatelaine. Those were things that her grandmother used for her, you know, to wear on her dress and keep her needles and things in. So these were all family pieces in the one on the right. But Mary would collect, um, you know, she'd go to auction. She'd buy the contents of a woman's sewing basket or people would give her, you know, my mom died, here's the contents of her sewing basket. <laughs> she would save the things or, if she found a quilt that was in not such great shape, um, she might um, dissect it, she called it, and she would take the quilt, take it apart so that she could learn how it was put together. And she did this, you know, if she had another quilt that was a better example of that style, then she might take the one apart that was in poor condition because you can learn a lot from the, the seam allowance edges, you know, that maybe haven't faded because they've been protected from sun and detergent and things. So, um, you know, she did it for that purpose. And um, just to learn more about sometimes when she got inside a quilt, she took one quilt apart that was made during the Great Depression and found an old quilt, a tablecloth, and a couple pairs of long johns had been put in for the padding instead of buying batting or you know using a batting they used old discarded things that couldn't be used for their original purpose so they became the stuffing in a quilt um so there are things you can learn by taking it apart that that shocked me the first time when i i, I saw this notebook that she had that had the the pieces that were taken apart of a log cabin quilt that had more than 300 different fabrics in it and I couldn't believe she'd take it apart. All I could think of was this is somebody's work and how much time they put in it. How could she take it apart? And then you start to see the things you learn from it. Um, so, you know, I had to get over, get over myself on that one and, and, and then really just appreciate what she did to learn um, picking apart all those, all those quilts. And this is a, a, an exhibit at the State Historical Museum in about 2008, I think. Um, and the study, the uh, study, several of the study panels plus some quilts were hanging. And I took my students at the time, uh, we, I was at East High so we could walk to the historical museum and we were working on memoirs and how people tell their stories. And I wanted them to understand that you can tell stories in ways beyond words on paper or in books or things like that. Um, so they were, we, each student was supposed to design a quilt block. So we went down and we looked at some of the quilts and, and the, studied the names and what they meant and, and, you know, why they might've been named that and the different fabrics and colors and, um, students really, really enjoyed and got into that. Um, so, and again, some more of this, this study panel, you can tell it's all the same block. It was a quilt Mary took apart, um, because parts of it were not in good condition, but she saved what she could so that there would be samples of fabrics. And then she mounted them on the muslin so that they wouldn't get separated or lost or you know, people wouldn't know why they were there like that. So, so there are more than a hundred of the study panels now at the State Historical Museum in their collection. Mm -hmm. Mary, like I said, was not a quilter when um, she started on this, this ordeal of, of learning and researching everything. But I think you know, being around quilts a lot and then she, she made all of her own quilts um, throughout her life until she just couldn't do it anymore. And, um, but she started making quilts based on some of the old ones. So um, this is an example. The brown at the top is an old quilt top she found. Well, then she made one similar out of some blue fabrics um, just to get the feel for how the, the quilter um, assembled it, you know, made it, and then she tried it in a blue colorway instead of the brown. She liked to take the old quilts and adapt them. And um, sometimes, you know, sometimes she did it because it was a family quilt and she wanted to, um, to 
make some, you know, keep it alive. And then she would donate the originals, the, the vintage or old or antique ones uh, to the State Historical Museum or Living History Farms. And so this is one example, the sheet <laughs> blue, and then she gave it to the church ladies who quilted it so that they could auction it off and, and make some money on it. Um, sometimes she did it because a design is so rare and the quilt so fragile that um, she thought it was necessary to reproduce it so the design wouldn't be lost. So this quilt, um, has, it, it has not been found, the pattern. Mary could never find the pattern. She found some things that it was similar to, um, and, but nothing that was exactly like the, the swirling flower in the middle. So what she would do then out of her collections of old fabrics, she would try to remake a quilt in the same color ways so that the pattern would be alive and available for study, um, even if the quilt was rare and in poor condition and you know deteriorating and shouldn't be handled much. But she sometimes changed a few things. So notice on this one, she's got leaves in the corners and in the original one, and this is a picture of the original, it's a picture of a picture um, in the, the Living History Farms catalog. Um, so it's not clear and it's not as bright and pretty as it should be, but in, in the corners, instead of leaves like Mary did, the corners had little squares that were made by putting four triangles together. Um, so Mary just in, in her notes, she said, I don't know why anybody put four triangles or, you know, put square pieces in each corner because it looks like a flower. So she put leaves. So she might make little changes, but she tried to follow. And if you look at it, you can see she tried to put red where there was red or purple where there's purple, yellow where there was yellow um, and, um, and do it, you know, make it as close to the original as she could color wise. Um, this mosaic quilt uh, Mary made uh, and she did everything by hand. She just couldn't see that piecing something on a sewing machine could be relaxing. So even, you know, even, uh, four patch or something she would make by hand and she often used English paper piecing because because she liked it to be precise um, but this is a mosaic quilt and she based this off of an antique quilt top that she found and the original is at Living History Farms and I don't happen to have a picture of that original but she took out the original had sashing between each block um, that was a striped uh, a big stripe uh, print and so it separated it almost into like an album quilt. So you had the little stars with the light background, you know, the yellow center and then the brown um, triangles and then the uh, light colored diamonds then were surrounded by a stripe. And she wanted to put it together so it looked like a mosaic floor. She was trying to discover at one point, there were a lot of unnamed quilt patterns that were shown in different mag women's magazines, um, like Robert's Home Magazine or um, Godey's Ladies Magazine. Um, and she did research on ancient floor designs and uh, Interlibrary loaned a book from Harvard University Library on mosaic floors. Um, and yeah, it was published in the 1400s, I think it, 1400s, 1600s in England. Um, but anyway, she the only place that she could get the book was from Harvard. And so she went to Iowa State University Library and they helped her get it. And she studied and then she could identify different floors. And she said, those are the kinds of designs that are for all people. And, and people have always wanted to use design in a way that was beautiful. And um, that was just one way, you know, on floors and then quilters would adapt it from the floor. Um, and keep the designs going. Um, this one is horse of a different color. And this was an original pattern Mary came up with and she um, actually copyrighted the design, uh, but it was made for her grandchildren because she wanted something to cheer them up when they were sick and thought that this would do it. So her son Art was under strict orders whenever one of his children, her grandchildren were sick, to pull this quilt out, put it on the bed. And you know, to this day, they still remember laying in bed and petting the horse's manes, you know, and feeling all the different textures and things. Um, the next one, this one's Hawaii Remembered. And Mary and her husband, Tom, went to Hawaii. And so she wanted to make a Hawaiian <laughs> quilt uh, to commemorate the trip. And she was making it for her husband. Unfortunately, he died in 1980. 
1989, I believe, uh, late 1980s, um, and she didn't hadn't finished the quilt. So she put the blocks away uh, in a chest, a cedar chest or something. It was too painful to work on for a time. And then eventually she pulled it back out and she said, working on it, I realized I could still make something beautiful and it would still have the memories. And so working on it kind of became something she could do to remember the trip and how much fun she and her husband had together. And this is just a gorgeous, gorgeous quilt hanging in the exhibit. This one, we don't really know much about it other than it's uh, vintage indigo prints that Mary used to make a <laughs> real quilt. Um, and in the note, there's just a note on the back that says, you know, for Tom Barton and then has the quilt measurements. And other than that, um, not sure, you know, why she chose this. It was probably a pattern used in one of her family quilts, perhaps because she liked to replicate the ancestors quilts. Um, and it could have been because the very first quilt she ever made herself was a form of a reel, but she said at the time I didn't know about colors or contrast, so she did not have enough contrast, you know, the centers were dark, but then the, the parts around the center were a light lavender, and then the centers were purple, the outsides were a light lavender, and then again on a white backing, there wasn't enough contrast to see it. So she thought it was a terrible failure, but she kept it and learned from it and then made something different. Um, this is a family quilt that uh, Mary inherited and used on her son's bed until she almost killed it, which probably was part of why she started doing research into how you care for historical fabrics or historical quilts, you know, what, what would they have used on it and how do you do it so it won't deteriorate. But she restored this and by restoration, she means she took it almost completely apart. Well, she, she could use two complete blocks as they were and then she replaced fabric in all of the other blocks and um, got a new backing, well, a new backing of fabric from the same time period so that it would all you know, work together, did the same quilting lines and then used the old backing fabric as the binding on the new one. Um, but she said in her, in her journal, um, you know, I washed it so many times until it could take no more and I almost killed it. Um, and she saved and that's in, in her journal, she said, don't throw away anything. And there's a notebook that has every shred of fabric that she removed from the quilt and shred is the, the right word for it, um, but she saved it because you could still learn from the fabric, the threads, all of that kind of good stuff. Um, this one, Spring is Finally Here, made in 1994 um, out of Lloyd's of London fabric. And this was made for her granddaughter, Leah, um, for a wedding quilt. And if you're looking at this at the museum close up, Mary, Mary didn't do her own quilting. She um, always hired somebody to do the quilting because she didn't want to do that part of it. Uh, she just liked making the tops, but she would tell them how she wanted it. And this one has slanting lines. It looks kind of like rain going through it. And um, it's just, it's, it's a beautiful quilt, but Leah has the, the quilt and then all of the leftover fabrics, the Lloyds of London prints that she's saving. She, she's learning how to quilt too. And she said uh, in the, I think it was in the nineties, she took a quilt class in Ohio um, where her husband was in graduate school at the time. And um, she said, everybody in Ohio at the class knew my grandmother because uh, Mary was, was quite famous and well-known at that time. This is a colonial basket quilt that Mary made in 1991. And again, she pieced it, English paper piecing. And then the flowers in the basket were actually a, a, a dress that she purchased in a thrift store. And the dress probably dated to about the 1970s. And it's a cherry and leaf print. So Mary very carefully cut out what she wanted, you know, to go in the baskets and around the edges. And then she paid somebody to machine applique it on because uh, it's very, you know, tiny sharp points and things and, and it's beautiful machine applique work. But again, she hired somebody to do that because working uh, on a quilt on a machine, she didn't think would be relaxing. So um, that was not her, she would design it and then get somebody else to do the work. This quilt is probably the most famous of her quilts. She made this in 1976, and it was one of her earlier quilts. Um, 
And it was to tell the story of her family's uh, migration to Iowa, and then by extension, you know, the lives of, of other people who, who came to Iowa as um, pioneers. And um, the, the, the women on the quilt marching around, their path is, is laid with quilts because wherever the women went, the quilts went with them. And each, each block is different and all the little blocks. Um, this is the original indigo that she bought in that box of scraps in 1967 at the auction. She started this quilt in 1968 and she said she used to lay awake at night trying to figure out, puzzle out how, how to do something on, you know, like a, a design problem she was having. And originally she had tried machine piecing the tree blocks, but, um, but didn't like the way they came together. The points weren't perfect. So she ended up hand piecing them in the English way, as she said. So this, this is uh, like all of her other quilts, entirely hand appliqued, hand pieced, um, and containing symbols of, of the things that were important to her and her family. The men marching around the bottom, each one carries a different tool that would have been important to, you know, their, their, um, making the making a home making planting crops and things on their homestead in the corner there's there's a lot of very lovely detail on this quilt um a map of of the united states and it shows where her ancestors would have landed and settled along the east coast and then eventually maybe migrated to ohio or illinois or indiana or you know along the way and then eventually to iowa and so there are are threads to embroidered on to show their trips and then in the other corner there are facsimiles you know uh, I think she used marker on on fabric I can't remember exactly but letters and documents of of her early um, her early ancestors coming to Iowa so um no, that, how, how big are those little quilt blocks next to the women do you know the measurement I know they're small they're small. They're probably about maybe four inches by four inches. Oh, okay. They're, they're very tiny. Um, and she was meticulous, you know, and did everything by hand. So they're all tiny and perfect. Um, and the little girls walking beside their mamas, you know, there's um, this quilt. Uh, she entered it in the uh, bicentennial, official bicentennial quilt contest in Michigan. And that's really where she became then nationally famous. Um, because um, the quilt and traveled all over. It was, it was uh, juried into a lot of shows um, after the bicentennial. Um, my friend Jody at the Historical Museum is doing some research. Uh, one of the sons said it hung at the White House for a while. So um, Jody's looking into that um, at, from the museum end so that she can track down that story. Um, but it's just, you know, it's a great quilt um, and it, it captures that moment in the bicentennial era. And I like using this quilt with students when we're talking about symbolism and things and then talking about stuff like, you know, well, is this how all people got to Iowa or, you know, was anybody in Iowa when they already got here? Well, it's a great way then to introduce handwork of the Native American tribes that were already here. And we use handwork from other immigrants like the the um, Hmong immigrants who do the very detailed uh, embroidery um, styles. And when you put those all together, it just makes such a beautiful story because you're getting all the stories, um, not just one story. So um, I love using quilts and things in my classroom. Pictures when I, you know, sometimes I can borrow the quilts from the museum because the museum will loan um, things, you know, and a staff member will bring them and do school visits because part of their mission is to get these objects in front of Iowans so that that everybody can appreciate them because they belong to Iowans. Um, and it's just fascinating to have kids interact with the objects and make a connection like, oh yeah, my grandmother made me a quilt and here's what it looks like. They can, they can connect to that. So, um, I think quilts have a, a very valuable place in education and it's my mission to keep them there. Um, and it was Mary's too, because she collected all these things and then felt an obligation to share what she collected. It wasn't, she doesn't do it for herself. She did it and she'd amassed this information and then she had to, had to share it. And um, I could do a whole nother program 
on all the different lectures she gave, or she had organized an, a, a conference at Iowa State University um, in the 1980s that was really the first of its kind where she brought in international um, you know, speakers and, and, and had what was modern quilts at the time in, in one place on campus, um, traditional quilts, which meant they were made made contemporarily, so made in the 1970s and 80s using traditional patterns, and then the antique quilts, the originals that inspired, you know, the work at, in another place on campus. Well, uh, Star, one of our board members, yeah. Star Ann Cloberdance, she's actually going to do a Tuesday at 12 on that conference. Excellent. Okay, then I'm glad I didn't have time to include that, and I, I will look forward to seeing that on, um, you're gonna record it and put it on the yes. website, right? Yes, yes, because I talked to Star Anne for my dissertation and she was just a wealth of stories about Mary. Um, it's hard to do uh, like a narrative biography on someone like Mary after they're gone because it's just, oh, I wish I could talk to her and find out. But there were people who knew her, you know, with between her family members and then like Star Anne who, who worked with her. Um, and she'll have some really great stories to tell about Mary and, and all of that. So I will leave some of those for her. Besides, I think I've probably gone way over my time. I tend to do that. Um, no. I advise, my advisor says you use a lot of words and I never do quite many. <laughs> well, that's why you're such a good speaker. And, um, <laughs> and we enjoy the stories that you share with us and your wealth of information about Mary Pimble Barton and the way that she <laughs> I have to do the jabs hands to wave goodbye. That's how I knew I was at the end. Yes, there you go. Um, mm -hmm. That's me, Randall and Megan. Um, anyway, Randall had the audacity you. to tell me that she didn't photograph well, and I think that is the best photo. I just I love it. Great, yeah. I love the happiness. <laughs> I love the happiness in this photo. There's just so much joy in working with quilts, isn't there? And I, yeah. our customers are wonderful too, because you know they love quilts. That's why they. Yes. Um, thank you so much. I we're looking, I'm just looking real quick. Okay, great. Um, see, we had any questions. I wanted to ask you, what is one thing that you, um, learned in researching Mary Pimble Barton? One thing that you're going to take away as a quilter. One thing I'm going to take away as a quilter, um, do it for the love of doing it and enjoy it. And um, if it takes a long time to finish a quilt, enjoy the time and don't be afraid to adapt or try your own thing. Um, because I just love, she loved to do the traditional patterns, but she always did some twist that made it her own. And I just, I love that. So that's what I'll take away as a quilter. Awesome, wonderful. Um, and as a teacher, I want to tell you what I take away as a teacher. Yeah. <clears throat> You've got to nourish, uh, nurture kids' curiosity because the reason that she did all of this and, and then you look at her son's lives and then their kids' lives, they were born and raised to ask questions and find answers and to enjoy the process of engaged hands-on inquiry and learning. And it's just, it's like total excitement and energy when they start talking about all of the things they did and then all of the things they still do. And it's all because of their, their curiosity is nurtured as children. And so that's my teaching takeaway. If somebody's curious about something, let them. Hi, Randall. I had Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and also write the story of your quilt. Yes. That's probably oh, one of the is um, how to share the details of the quilt because I think mm -hmm. we overlook some small details that we just assume people know, but in 50 years they might not know that. Exactly. Um, so it's gonna it's gonna keep those stories going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about anybody else have any questions? Otherwise, we'll say uh, good afternoon and enjoy your evening. All right. Well, thanks again, Millie. Oh, um, you're welcome. The, the um, exhibit's up until November 14th, and then we're closed November 15th, uh, putting up our new exhibit called Here Comes the Sun. It's a 
It's a mm -hmm. compilation of quilts with orange, uh, many different artists. Um, our guest curator is Joe Cunningham out of San Francisco. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's gonna be a fun exhibit. We're gonna miss this exhibit, um, but we look forward to bringing in a new one too. And it's been a lot of success. So thank you, Millie. I think okay. it was a great blessing that we were able to bring this one in. It, it was so much fun for me. I just have enjoyed this opportunity so much. And once Living History Farm is back up and running, we could do it again with new quilts of Mary Barton. So yes, I new would go quilts. there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see everyone. Um, October 26th is our next one called Quilts That Go Bump in the Night. Should mm. be a lot of fun. And we'll get more information out to you next week. All right. Bye. Thank you so much. I, uh, I knew.